When did you first become interested in the field of dyslexia? Uh, my interest is, uh, came basically totally by accident. Um, I had graduated from uh, Randolph-Macon College with uh, an undergraduate degree in mathematics and had been accepted at the University of Virginia in their master's and PhD program and I was really excited about that. Went to UVA, there were some personal things that came up in my life that just made me not able to deal with graduate school and my personal stuff, so I left. And I, instead of going home to Waynesboro, Virginia, I told my parents I need to work through these issues. They were supportive, and I went back to Richmond. And at the same time I was going back, I said, i got to find a way to take care of myself, live. So I got a part-time job at Best Products in their warehouse. I was staying at my fraternity house just for a while. And all of a sudden, I was looking in ads in a newspaper, and there was an ad for a need for a math teacher. And I had done uh, student teaching in undergraduate, and I had actually done, I had taught at Fishburne Military School the previous summer before I started graduate school as a general education math teacher. Uh, so I, I sent uh, information, I uh, called them and said, could you send me information? I didn't have a mailing address in Richmond, so I said, send it to my mom in Waynesboro. Uh, I told her that she was getting something. She, I called her, did you get it? Yes, I've got it. I don't know where the brochure is, but I have the application. I said, send me the application. I said, uh, I filled it out, sent it in, and I did get a call uh, to ask if I'd like to interview, and I had just started that week at Best Products. So uh, I went in, I was interviewed by the head of the school, who is Mary Louise Truesdale, who is also a past board member of the International Board at IDA. Uh, then it was the Orton Society. Uh, and she was apparently impressed with this young guy who was enthusiastic and uh, said, she did ask me the question, now you've read the brochure about the school. Well, I was looking for a full-time job, so I said yes, even though I never knew what it was. So she eventually said, called me back that very same day and said, you know, can you come until we finish the interview process because the person who is leaving, who was uh, an arts teacher, a, uh, a music teacher, was going back to graduate school. And I said, you know, if I leave the job I have without a guarantee for a job, I won't have the job I have, and it's the only way I'm surviving right now. So she said, okay, and then she called me back later and said, we'd like to offer you the job. So I started teaching in October of uh, 1970, October, November of 1974 as a math teacher. I was the only one uh, teaching 7th, 8th, and ninth grade math uh, to the new community school in Richmond, Virginia, which still exists as, and did, it was their very first year of existence. And it's a college preparatory school for students with dyslexia. And so I was on their faculty to start with. And that's how I got introduced to uh, dyslexia, the, uh, what is now the International Dyslexia Association, and uh, became more involved. But I was there first as not as a specialist in learning disabilities or dyslexia, but basically because I had uh, the background of mathematics and as a, ma as a math teacher. That's fascinating. So you mentioned Mary Louise Truesdale as a very influential person getting you started. Were there any other mentoring or important figures in you know, your graduation as you moved up along? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the school had a consultant at that time that helped them. Uh, the school was actually formed by a group of parents. They brought in a very dynamic woman. She was a little dynamo, as people would look at her. Uh, her name was Alice Ansara. So she was the consultant to the school, mentored all the teachers who did not know anything about dyslexia. And the other thing the 
school did is that they said we are also requiring you to take graduate classes at the University of Richmond where Alice was come, came in every other month to teach classes how they worked it out with the university so they had a program there for that led to a master's degree in education with an emphasis in learning disabilities uh, was the term used but it was all her all the basic uh, special education or specialized instruction was by her uh, and therefore uh, she became a really very strong mentor and at the same time I was in graduate school there uh, one of the courses that I took uh, was uh, assessment and the University of Richmond at that time in the 70s uh, basically had their education students and their psychologists take the same class together as the school psychologists or if you're getting a master's degree in school psychology on assessment on how to administer different assessments including the WISC, the WACE, others. And the thing that became fascinating is that they made us, before we really got into the class, go through their assessment center and be assessed so we know what it's like to be assessed. We're graduate school students. We don't have problems. You know, see what, how it goes. Well, I will tell you, uh, that was nerve-wracking. And basically from that, and then sitting down with Alice and talking about my results, uh, we figured out um, in my history and how well I, uh, what I had and hadn't done through school and problems I had, is that I had myself had dyslexia, but I had a really high ability and was making it through as a quote-unquote fairly average, some people said above average, but you know, I made it through school and did well and made it through college, uh, but I struggled with reading, writing, and spelling all my life. I didn't like arithmetic. I still have problems with my times tables. I love the abstractness of mathematics, and my teachers and undergraduate uh, at Randolph-Macon really didn't matter in math whether I could write sentences or not or spell correctly. They were more interested in my thinking and my abstract abilities to problem solve, which were the things that made me feel really very comfortable. Fabulous. So therefore, as a teacher, then you, you spent a number of years at New Community School, and then gradually you were introduced to this organization. Uh, at that time, the Orton Society, and then eventually Orton Dyslexia Society, and then now uh, IDA. Right. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that progression? Sure. Uh, when I, I became a member, one of the other things New Community is they, you became a member of the Orton Society when you were a teacher. That was one of their benefits, their membership. Uh, and at that time, there wasn't a Virginia branch. It was called the Central Virginia Branch. Uh, and it was uh, centered in Charlottesville. Uh, the person who started it was uh, Rebecca Richardson, fascinating woman, loved her. And she was one that also encouraged me to speak at, about math and to do that. And she invited me initially to a couple things, uh, which really helped me along. And, and one of the things, uh, and I really appreciated her leadership in Virginia, besides Mary Louise, but she really had the impetus of starting the branch. It was all around her and her husband, who was a professor at University of Virginia, who was also dyslexic. Uh, but I became involved, started attending meetings. I got on their board uh, as a board member. Uh, you know, I think having a male on the board that was also in education was a really positive thing for nonprofits. Um, and I went through the ranks of being treasurer of the Virginia branch, then president of the Virginia branch. And being president allowed me to come to branch council. And I had lots of opportunities to meet and socialize and to interact with uh, people in the uh, uh, other branches and on branch council. And I expressed my opinions, and uh, there was an opportunity at Branch Council when we had a joint meeting in uh, Iowa City that allowed me to 
sort of step forward and volunteer to be on a joint branch council board uh, committee to even be chair, to head it up, to look at some of the contentious issues between the branches and the board. And Rosemary Bowler, who was the executive director then, was really very excited about it. So I got introduced to both. I was never branch council chair, but I got introduced to the board. I worked with board members and branch council, and we came up with a consensus on how to resolve some of the issues. It went to the board, and I got to present to the board, and it got approved. Uh, and then eventually, I got elected to be on the board uh, as a member at large, and uh, I served there as for a number of time, uh, terms. I then was, I think, a vice president. I don't remember, but then I had president elected and then president. But I have done a lot of things in the organization in that sense. I, if you look at while people may or not have their issues about our current bylaws, I know that when uh, I took on the role of being chair of the bylaws committee and revised the last major revision uh, to sort of deal with the issues we dealt with at that time, uh, I did stuff with regards to increasing the requirements of branches. And I think I brought a perspective to, uh, uh, to the board and the organization, uh, the International Board, of understanding what branches needs are. Because Virginia was not a large branch, it was a small branch. As well as my, I was at that time then in public schools. Because uh, I, I left New Community School to go back to graduate school full time. I'm not very good at handling a teaching career because I think the way I learn and the way I work. So I was there, I went back to graduate school full time, and then when I left graduate school, I went into public schools at a high school uh, in the late 70s, um, and at the, at the beginning of what was going on there, in public schools, because when I was hired, this is just, think of it, in a fairly large, in Chesterfield County public schools, before the year I was hired, they had one itinerant teacher for students with learning disabilities in all seven of their high schools. The first year, the year I was hired, they were hiring for the first time uh, a learning disabilities teacher for each of the high schools. In my high school, we had three te special ed teachers, one for uh, what is now referred to as intellectual disabilities, um, emotional disabilities, and learning disabilities. And we were considered to have a very big population with just three teachers. And it evolved as I was there. It became housed of all the different disabilities except for severe and a center base for some of the others uh, uh, around the county. And I was department chair there. And then eventually I left there. But that's sort of me, a sort of career in, in IDA. But uh, I have to give IDA the credit for uh, giving me the opportunity to learn to speak and so forth. And in that career, uh, Alice Kuntz was a phenomenal friend and always encouraging and always giving her ideas and moving uh, along uh, as another person. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's been a phenomenal career. It really has been, and actually, the, while you were president, uh, the, some of the restructuring that you were responsible for and you initiated is still, you know, we're still standing on those decisions, and it's the the the, uh, in, in the association's really become that much stronger because of your commitment well, and your you. ideas, thank and, you. and it's been restated many times. So, really, coming from that. The, the dual perspective of a uh, independent school teacher and then a public school teacher. Can you contrast in any way how, you know, I guess more on the public school sector, you know, are public schools doing what they should be doing? Are they uh, identifying, are they helping out this community of uh, struggling dyslexic students? I think in my career I've always Having been a part of new community and understanding the unique needs of those students, and there are some kids that are very memorable to me there. But I realized that if I'm going to, if I was going to make a bigger difference, most of the kids were going in public schools. Private schools will never be able to handle all of them. They're just, they are, they are small. They intend, they need to, they like to stay small, not get very large. 
so they can provide the intensity of services and um, so I looked at public schools as where uh, you can make a difference and, and the reason I went into secondary education is because that's the last chance public schools has the chance to make a difference in the lives of individuals. Even those that are still struggling at secondary, you can still make the difference, give them the appropriate instruction, get them to develop the skills they need so they can make the choices in their lives. Uh, whether they decide to go into uh, a vocational kind of career, go on to college, go into business for themselves, whatever their desires, it's not they're being tracked. So that's the big reason I stayed in secondary. Um, and I do think, and I was fortunate enough that uh, when I was in public schools, my the director uh, that I had, or the assistant director, she understood what I knew and actually valued it and let me have whatever I wanted to order. She never put a um, amount of money, you can't go over this budget. I she, want. She trusted you. Yes. Uh, and she uh, encouraged me. So when I wanted to order materials to use an Orton Gillingham type based program with the kids we were using, I was pulling out for resource or in the areas of reading and so forth, go right for it. So I was able to do that and uh, that was amazing to me. That said, you know, that told me uh, public schools do care. Um, and I think throughout my career, because so I went from public schools, I went to private sector for all, then ended up at the Virginia Department of Education and policy issues and kept pushing for the fact that some of these constraints that people say, well, you have to have a discrepancy to be, have a learning ability. And, and I was, for my 13 years there, talking around the state, whatever I said, the discrepancy isn't the disability, the discrepancy is a threshold. That you, regardless you ha have, uh, whether you're passing or not, you still can be eligible for services. You don't have to be failing. So looking at those kinds of things and pushing it, and I think I made a difference in those ways, as well as working with the disability groups uh, at my time at the department, we were able to, I was able to uh, help them coalesce and present to the board when they were changing teacher licensing regulations uh, what we thought a teacher with learning disabilities needed to have in a, as a part of their program endorsement and if you read it you were going you would see all the stuff that IDA has been very intent about about uh, written instruction multi-sensory structured approach all the bases of reading and written language as well as some issues with math and social skills but really put those kind of core things into the licensing requirements now and had the support of coalescing the other five learning disabilities groups in the state to come to consensus and support it. That, to me, I felt so good because the department the, was trying to move away from that and I helped on my own time to coalesce and get them to how to go about making changes, how to advocate for it, how to influence policy change to not only the, the Department of Education, but also to individual board members. And there were people who wanted to do that. So it was an amazing piece. I never stood up and said, this is, no, I sort of helped. And that was, that was great. That taught me a lot of things. Yeah, you, I mean, it's obvious you were a consensus builder. You certainly got the motivations and the minds and the ideas of people and brought them together. And at the State Department of uh, Virginia in Department of Education, weren't you? You were director of special services for a while there. No, I was. I only thing I, I was what you call the lowest peon on the totem pole. I was the specialist for the air. You're humble. Uh, no, I was the specialist for learning disabilities. Um, but then I took at the department uh, opportunities to speak on other topics that dealt with policy uh, procedures that no one else in the department. I said, I'll go take it, I'll do it, I'll, I'll develop the presentation. And, and then I became one who talked around the state. And eventually my ideas, 
way you do it, and you influence people uh, about the uh, how to take a look at what uh, procedural rights are, due process rights, but what are proceed you know what do you have to do to really ensure you're doing it right and informed consent. Uh, I made a great influence on uh, the how IEPs should have been should be written and actually developed a model IEP form that eventually got adopted by a lot of folks in the state. And of course that's evolved over time. That was that was some time ago. But I I found out that, you know, I just took on those topics no one wanted because they were not easy. And I began to realize that as I presented, it became more and more this is the way to do it. So I knew I could influence that. And people could see the rationale behind it and the reasoning why it was better. Get away from writing IEPs that are quote unquote rewriting the standards. Write it on the skills students need. Can you teach it through a, I incorporate that into a general education class that may be an English or a history class? Yes, but address the skills so that I would say a kid who had a real severe emotional problems but no academic, you could have nothing but behavioral goals for that student. But you could pull them out for different content. You may still be getting the content, but the reason for it was to address the behavioral and social issues, not the academic. And I didn't have to write the academic. I mean, I really kept pushing that you focus on the individual, their unique needs. Then you look at where you're going to be able to meet those services. And it could be in, in a special ed classroom. It could be in a general ed classroom. It could be collaboratively taught. But you don't just rewrite a curriculum that exists for all kids in IP, which was what happened then, still happens, but that was my philosophy. And I've always believed that. Center around the individual kid and what supports they need. That's fantastic. So now that you can proudly look back on uh, many of these interventions and, and mm -hmm. accomplishments you've had, uh, you've, uh, you've moved on a bit. You've retired from the State Department. Is that well, actually, you did. You were quite close. I actually at the Department of Education, and then I, I had an opportunity. Joe Linda Mary, who was superintendent in Virginia, said uh, the city of Richmond's director of special ed had resigned over uh, very contentious issues. Just hard. We're going to. We, they want us to loan someone you and uh, to help as an interim and. You were the first person that came to mind. She said, I know you want to be a director sometime in your life, and I'm going to give you the opportunity to just go there. You'll be still working for us, but you can see what it's like to be a director. And if you like it and they, you want to apply, go for it. And if you get it, that's great. If not, you still have a job here at the department. And actually, she called me while I was at the Virginia Branch Conference in Richmond in the spring. Uh, I, I don't even remember the year. So I said, she said, I need to know to let them know. And I said, so I said, can I give you about, give me 10 minutes. She said, sure, call me back. So I called her and I said, OK, I'll do it. And believe it or not, I'm the only person in the entire history of the Department of Education they've ever loaned to a school division <laughs> to be an interim director. A great distinction. Uh, it was her faith in me and what I, she knew who I was and what I wanted to do and my abilities. And she thought it would be a good fit. I applied. I got the job. Uh, I was also involved with IDA, and uh, there were, uh, uh, so I was, I was the director of special education and student services for Richmond City for about nine years, and then I retired this past uh, January, end of January. And uh, I had a great staff, and the school system was very supportive in the things I requested to make changes. And we did. Uh, I think we ended up having, we have, oh, we still have, they still have their issues. Uh, but we made a difference for all the students in looking at how we uh, work collaboratively. I've had great partners there, um, the current superintendent uh, and the uh, person who is in charge of uh, instruction and uh, overseas in instruction. We worked together and it was such a good collaboration that we all were saying the same thing. It's like 
it's not special education over here and general education over here. We do it together. And it made a difference for kids. And then I was able to then infuse the things that I thought needed to be done, particularly for students with dyslexia and other learning disabilities, and uh, you know, make those changes over time. I, I know how to build a consensus, and I know how we need to do it tomorrow. I said, I know what we, just give me the time. It may not be tomorrow, but you'll see it happen. And people say, I need, you know, and they will say, yeah, you said we would get there. It's just you knew the ins and out to get there. It may have been a little bit longer, but we got what we needed. So I feel really very good about when I left Richmond City Public Schools uh, of what I had done and how special education had changed. And in fact, we had av parent, parent advocates who would say for, before Richmond was, you can't get anything. Uh, I have parent advocates that are very vocal in Richmond. We're telling people, if you want services for your kids with disabilities, go to Richmond City Public Schools. They do better at looking at your child's unique needs than our surrounding sister county school systems, which are much larger uh, than the city of Richmond, and kept on touting they will meet your needs. If your child needs speech language, they'll make sure it's provided. It's not, I have to go in and fight tooth and nail to get a service. And I told, my philosophy was, kids first. And if they need something, that's my responsibility to find a way, even the fiscal way, to meet those needs. Don't let that be the issue. And so that made a difference. Absolutely made a difference. So Harley, what are you doing now with your time? How are you <laughs> staying involved? And uh, because you have so much to offer and contribute, and you've done so much in the past, you need time on your own. But it, People in this field seem not to really retire. They seem to keep their hand and foot and mind and heart in, in this organization and in the, the uh, working for the needs of these kids. How are you spending your time? Uh, um, my time has been really, when, since I left, I lived, I've, 10 months I've been basically being at home as a stepdad and my stepson actually has dyslexia. My partner, I, uh, he got uh, custody of him about uh, two years ago. And that's been a sort of a nice full-time job. Uh, I'm involved with that. But then, you know, I needed some time to decompress. Uh, coming here was really good for me to get myself back involved. Um, and I've told uh, folks, you know, if there's anything I can do, let me know. But. You know, I'll start doing things. I'll start doing things with the Virginia branch. But when you were when you're a director in a public school, that takes 24/7 out of your life and weekends. I would come to conferences, and I would still do some things, but not. Uh, and, and right now, it's just been like a little lull. But you know, I'll I'll, I'll get back involved. But it's uh, you know, I credit IDA for. Uh, making a difference in all kids' lives, and it's like definitely made a difference in my life as an individual with dyslexia, and helped me develop my talents and skills to be able to share what I know and to appreciate the talents of what a, a person who doesn't read well, because I am still a slow reader. I do read, I do write, I love using the computer. My spelling is atrocious. When you ask me to pronounce a word I haven't seen, it takes me a while to think about how to say it. Um, I will still have word retrieval problems occasionally. Um, someone, I'll give you, give you something I've, I taught my kids to do. I said, I don't know my times tables and there's still facts I don't know. Automatically, it's sort of scary. But if I, someone asked me what is the, uh, say five times uh, eight. If I don't know it, what I will do is say five times eight is. And by me repeating it, my brain is working very quickly to come up with the answer. So by the time I get to the is, I have figured out the answer, but I've given myself, instead of standing there, uh, I have learned to say, repeat the problem or say something. And by the time I get there, I will have cognitively figured out the answer, even though I don't know it automatically. So no one knows I don't know it. It just sounds like, oh, I'm just doing a very good technique of repeating what you said. Mm -hmm. 
So those kind of compensating things that have been helpful, and um, that's, you know, I still survive. I still have my, my issues, and, um, but it's, it's great, and I think people need to understand that. And, you know, along my career, I've had all kinds of, met all types, all kinds of people who've been very encouraging uh, to continue what I do. I think, um, particularly in this organization, I mean, uh, all the past presidents have always been great resources for me to, if I need to talk to someone. We may see each other a couple times a year or once a year, but I know they're always there if I need to talk or call or email. And that's the most, I have the most lasting friendships and professional relationships with people because of this organization. Yeah, and that's been repeated many times in these interviews that the sense of community exists here and there's, a, even though they may only come together once a year at the national conference, uh, there's always that opportunity to link in and, and gain from some of the information that these people have. Well, Harley, we can't thank you enough to uh, dedicate your time here and all your dedication to all the years all the students and the uh, administrators, teachers, um, and people at these conferences, um, we are uh, indebted to your, your efforts and your time. It's been my pleasure, and I thank you know, IDA for what it's done for me. Thank you.